I'm sorry that it takes me so long to say something, but I hope you can tell that there is a lot there. I'm going to finish up in words and then finish up with slides another, and then we'll start on the cancer conundrum. When I said diabetes, what it is and what it isn't, what it isn't means that sugar does not cause diabetes. You cannot feed people enough sugar to make them get diabetes. You can't do it. It takes fat. And the fat, if you remember, interrupts the lining of the cell, if you will, so that sugar cannot be absorbed from the bloodstream, which the cell wants, thus lowering the sugar in the bloodstream and providing the cell with what kind of fuel? Perfect fuel. What's perfect fuel for the cell? Sugar. You can call it carbohydrate if you want, but it's glucose. Why is it perfect? Because when your cell burns, that's a metaphor, when it processes glucose to give you energy, all you get is water and carbon dioxide. If you burn either fat or protein, you get poisons. Your body has to try to get rid of those poisons. And that's why high-fat diets, partly why high-fat and high-protein diets are not good for you. All right, the next one is, to finish the, our message uh, last night, um, this is the summary that we covered that far. Replacing animal fat with plant fat reduces death from heart disease substantially. You remember that? And that was mainly shown by removing fat and adding fat. Remember that? You take out some saturated fat and give them some unsaturated fat, and you see unbelievable reductions in death or just plain disease from that condition. Now, when you do that, when you take out saturated fat and give them oil, the overall death rate does not change even though heart disease has dropped over 50%. Why? Go ahead. Because cancer increases. Does that sound familiar to you? What causes the increase in cancer? Oil. Uh, it's interesting to me that in the world, they try to tell you, well, this is good fat and that's not good fat. Any fat that's liquid, friends, causes inflammation. Cancer, heart disease, diabetes, uh, fibromyalgia, arthritis, all of those things either completely go away or get much better when you put people on a whole plant regimen without those oils. Are you all with me on this? Nut studies have shown that if the oil is left in the plant, then you get a decrease of 36% of the heart disease without what? No increase in cancer. Quite remarkable. Now, if the fat intake is reduced down to 10% of your total calories, atherosclerosis can be reversed. And I told you when I started this lecture, was it last night, that I would show you the process. I didn't get that far, so I'm going to show it to you now. And we looked at the idea that plaque can rupture, causing heart attacks. This is a, an actual photograph of a macrophage. Macro means large, phage, these are Greek words, it means eater. And I'm sorry that it looks like this is his left eye and this is his right paw. That is not the case. This is actually a picture of the front of a book I have on immunology. And it's a great picture. It's taken on a microscope slide with a scanning electron microscope so you get the 3D impression there. And this little gadget right here is actually a germ. And this macrophage can tell that and he's reaching out there, he's oozing out there, and he's going to ooze around it and enclose it. And then, if you will, digest it. Now, I have an interesting video here, if I can find it, of a macrophage. They only travel by oozing. 
They ooze along. And I don't know if you have silly putty in this country, but in our country, grandparents give their grandkids silly putty. They may set it down somewhere, and the next morning it's spread halfway across the table. That's kind of how a white blood cell travels. It oozes or spreads in one direction. And if I can find this wonderful video here, uh, it's a, an electron micrograph. It's, you couldn't see this with a light microscope. But notice this macrophage, and it's chasing this germ. Can you see how he's oozing? And the germ is running for its life. <laughs> and finally, he manages to corner the germ. And now, these macrophages in our body travel constantly. I need to get back to my keynote here. They travel constantly in our bodies looking for things that shouldn't be there and, if you will, eating them, uh, including germs, including other cells that are sick or dying or have died. They're marvelous creatures. Day and night, while you sleep or whatever, they're patrolling. And this is their name, just means a big eater big because this is a pretty large white blood cell. Of course, it's tiny, but uh, when we uh, magnify it, we can see what it's like. Now, this is a drawing that shows you how coronary artery disease occurs and then how it's uh, removed. So I'm going to take this much of the picture and make it fill the screen. And because it's going to be magnified so much, will actually see cells. What is this white ring called? Anybody? The intima? How many cells thick is it? One cell? Amazing organ. It is an organ. Every artery in our body, no matter how small, is lined with this amazing lining, which serves various purposes. But understand now, I'm about to show you, so the left, upper left half of the screen will be inside the artery, something like this. So this is inside the artery. This is the layer that is the intima. And these are all, uh, if you will, muscle cells. The artery is a muscle, expands and contracts. So what happens? is, uh, let's see, where did that arrow come from? Oh, I'm just showing you that that's the inside and then the muscle. I, it's automatic and I was doing it by hand. That's the intima lining. And what happens is that uh, the intima can be damaged. It's usually a chemical damage. It actually can be mechanical, but it's usually some kind of a poison that's in our blood because of what we ate. and the cell becomes unhealthy. What kind, of a, what kind of a molecule might do that? How about an oil molecule that's oxidized? Are you all with me? It will attack the chemistry of this cell and kill it and other possible mechanisms. So that cell dies and along come, I'm going to show it with a dent. It's not a dent. It's a chemical assault. You all with me? But I, I made a dent there just to help you understand that that's the cell in question that we're looking at. And uh, along comes a macrophage and eats it up, cleans up the mess, and then it goes on its way. And a decision is made between these two cells. They communicate with each other chemically. A decision is made as to which one will copy itself. This whole thing is, folks, is under beautiful control. If cell replication were not under control, we would be a great big tumor, right? It's just a marvel, friends. These cells talk to each other. It's a metaphor, chemically. And uh, we don't know exactly how this happens, but a decision is made, 
and one of them copies itself, and now everything is okay again. Here's the problem. If, while the macrophage is there, there are too many LDL particles, everybody knows about HDL and LDL, correct? Low density lipoprotein, high density. Li there are 16 different particles. It's not just HDL and LDL. All kinds of lipoproteins, we call them. And these are essentially fatty particles. They're partly made of protein, but they're fatty particles in the blood. And if there's too many of them while the macrophage is there cleaning up, I think this will make sense to you. The macrophage not only cleans up dead cells and germs, if there's too much fatty particles in the blood, the, the macrophage will try to take care of it. And while he's there cleaning up, he fills up with these fatty particles because there's too much fat in the blood, and he dies. We actually call it, every physician in this room would know this, maybe some of the other health professionals, we call this a foam cell. Why foam? Because it's fatty stuff, you understand me? And uh, guess what happens when he dies? What happened when an intimacell cell died? I hear you mumbling a little bit. A, white, a macrophage came along and cleaned it up. What happens when the macrophage dies? A macrophage comes and cleans it up. <laughs> Got it? Now follow me. It is the buildup of these macrophages that is the plaque. Got it? I'm looking at your face this is to see if there's recognition of what I'm trying to describe. Some of you aren't giving me any clues, but <laughs> I want you to understand. Would somebody have a question to ask to clarify what I've just described because it seems like mud to you? Anybody brave enough? <laughs> Go ahead. It looks like you have a question. Go, go ahead. Are the macrophages reabsorbed? Yeah, like it disappears because, I, I mean, it's already dead, right? Very, very slowly. This is plaque. How quickly oh. does plaque go away by itself? Very long very, time. Very, very yeah. slow. Yes. Unless you lower, follow me, friends. This is a very good point she raises. If you will change your lifestyle, and eat a whole plant regimen, which would be much lower in fat, then the macrophages, would it make sense that the macrophages could clean up this plaque? Please say yes. Got it? That's how the body does it, but it will only happen. Remember what uh, um, uh, Caldwell Esselstyn did? First of all, Dean Ornish, he, I'll tell you about Caldwell. Dean Ornish got the fat intake down to 10%. Only plants, and what did he leave out in the plants? The four categories of plants that are high in fat, correct? Remember that? And he, This is Dean Ornish, San Francisco, University of California, San Francisco. He's the guy that raised the money by himself to do the study, remember that? And uh, if you get the fat intake low enough, then the macrophage can clean can clean this up without dying while he does it and making more plaque. Got it? That's exactly how the body reverses coronary artery disease. Not the hard plaque. We have no evidence that the hard plaque will go away. I suppose if we did an experiment that ran for 20 years, probably it would. But nobody has seen hard plaque go away. But uh, a number of researchers have shown that you can make the soft plaque clean up. Caldwell Esselstyn, the guy that wrote the book How to Reverse Heart Disease, gets the fat intake down to 7% in order to 
be more vigorous with the cleanup. And he does that by not only removing these four, he picks other things that are a little higher in fat than some of the others and takes those out of the diet so he can get enough low fat to clean up plaque uh, very, very well. So you can reverse heart disease, friends. And you know that the big issue is rupturing through the intima with uh, uh, plaque so that it causes a clot. It's the clot that kills what percentage of people when you're talking about death from coronary artery disease? What percent? 99%. Only one out of 100 die because the plaque filled the artery. You all with me on this? Okay. Now, this is very interesting. It's a little technical, but you can get it. What is this thing right here that the artist has drawn? What is that? A macrophage. And the macrophage has receptor, 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 receptor in its effort to clean up the blood from all these fatty particles. The receptors are quite a few different kinds, so it can do the best job possibly. This just takes, this takes in an oxidized LDL particle. That's especially bad. An LDL particle is bad in itself, but if it's oxidized, it's really toxic. So the macrophage can grab it. And uh, this, the interesting thing about this is when the LDL is oxidized, what does it say here is happening? This, LD, this oxidized LDL is getting absorbed how? How? Fast. Is that good or bad? It's bad. So this is an amazing diagram here. It, it, it would take some pretty serious time in a biochem class to just look through each of these things and all the steps that take place. But the idea is that these receptors are going to do their job. But listen, if there isn't much of this stuff out there, will the macrophage ever fill up with fat and die? No. Now, there is a really bad actor the most potent of all these particles that are being absorbed is what we call, we've labeled it LPA, LP little a, if you wish. And that is a bunch of LDL particles that glom together, and this particular receptor grabs them, pulls them in, and how quickly? which makes the macrophage fill up quickly and die and become plaque. You all with me on this? So the answer, folks, there is only one answer. Medications are not the answer. The answer is to use the Garden of Eden diet without refining the foods. Now, there is an exception there, and I believe refining it so you have a little bit of sweetener I think in the Garden of Eden, things were a lot sweeter than they are today. So to take a little bit of refined sugar uh, and sweeten things, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, <laughs> is just fine. And some of you didn't hear this because someone came to me talking about, well, isn't this oil good and isn't that oil not so good? Listen carefully. You, you heard this already to what uh, Caldwell Ezelson says. Oil injures endothelial cells. Olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in bread, oil in a salad dressing. So I have a number of people, even on a plant-based diet, that will come in and say, Dr. Stoll, I'm eating really well, but I'm still gaining weight. And my first question to them is, well, how much olive oil, coconut oil, etc., are you using in your diet? When they start to add it up, sometimes they're adding five, six tablespoons a day. So here we are, you know, six, seven hundred calories they're adding to their diets and they don't realize it because they're adding in oils that they assume are healthy. There aren't some special oils you can buy that are health promoting. What did he just say? There are no oils that you can buy that are health promoting. Listen, these five physicians that I'm having you listen to are the top people in the world in their knowledge about what I'm talking about today. Are you with me on this? 
So please get this. There are no healthy oils. The, the, the people out there uh, promoting these things, is one oil a little better than another? Well, yes, perhaps, but that's not the issue, folks. They're all bad for you. How should you get them? Do you need those oils? Say yes. How should you get them? Eat the food that has the oil in it. Okay. I want you to hear the rest of this. They're all processed foods with almost no levels of micronutrients and phytochemicals in them, with no fiber. Coconut oil is 90% saturated fat. Lard is 43% saturated fat. The coconut oil miracle is that it's still on the market. What did he last say? The only miracle about coconut oil is that it's still for sale. You know what he's talking about. People have been selling coconut oil as though it's a miracle food. Here's a quick story. Uh, we were invited to come to Australia and do a speaking tour across the whole nation and clear up the Gold Coast. And to my utter, what shall I say, amazement that our hosts that had invited us are promoting the sale of coconut oil as a miracle food. And I'm thinking, Lord, what, what am I going to do? I finally brought the topic up. And they said, well, I said, my lectures are about how oil is dangerous. And I'm sorry you paid a lot of money to get us down here. <laughs> really precious people. Don't misunderstand this, folks. All of us can be mistaken and not know it and thinking we're do the Lord, doing the Lord's will. Amen? That can happen to any of us. So they said, why don't you just try to not to mention it too much? <laughs> okay. But they were carting this coconut around, oil around in great, a great big trailer and selling five-gallon buckets of it to people because it was so good for you. They never invited us back. <laughs> Most places we go, people ask us to come back. <laughs> okay, listen to him. I want to tell you, folks, these are the top people in, in this science. So when we just hear little clips on the news, maybe on the internet, says olive oil's the way to go, we grab onto that. And unfortunately, it's bad information. There are three reasons to eat out. One. Got it? Any questions? Any comments? Okay. Let's carry on here. That is uh, finishing the heart of the matter. And now I want to go to today's topic. Uh, the cancer conundrum and I think I've already got it loaded let's see here there it is I'm going to tell you the good news first I mentioned this to a small group of people I was diagnosed 23 years ago with prostate cancer. And I elected to have surgery. They got it all. I put that in quotes. Uh, the tumor was probably as big as your th tip of your thumb if you're a male, a little bigger if you're a female. And I have memorized the pathology report. <laughs> Let me tell you this much. When they removed the gland, they put it in a little jar of ink. Let it sit for 20 minutes. Take it out and freeze it. And then the pathology cuts it up into very, very thin slices and examines every cell in every slice. These men and women are outstandingly uh, able and expert in their field. They can look at any cell and tell you in a moment where that cell came from in the body. They can see a tumor in your arm and say that came from where they can just see it just like that. Wonderfully, wonderful capacity. In any case, um, here, here's the uh, important part of the pathology report. See if you can get this. The adenocarcinoma, he's looking in the microscope, right? The adenocarcinoma closely approached the inked 
surgical margin. Get that? The pathologist could see where the knife cut, but it never cut through. Oh, closely approached the inked surgical margin, no transection was appreciated. In other words, no place in all of those slices did the knife cut through the tumor. So they, what are the three words? Got it all. Are y'all with me? Okay. After the surgery and I was recovering, I asked my urologist, so what's my prognosis? He said, you'll be dead in five years. I thought they got it all. Listen carefully. There's no exception to this. By the time a tumor is big enough to be imaged, and I sit with my friend, a radiologist, and watch him, and he just lets me ask questions on forever, watch all these images, and sometimes he can see a tumor that's not much bigger than a period at the end of a sentence. And when he sees something like that, he instantly jumps to the same mammogram as a year ago, and if the period is still there, what does he know? Was well, not a tumor. You all with me on that idea? But if, if, that, if that period little spot is not there a year ago, then he wants to know more about what he's seeing here. You all with me? Now, if it's larger, he can tell if it's cancer. But it's when tiny, it just looks like a tiny little image, see? So there's all kinds of work that has to be done. Anyway, the reason that my urologist said you have five years is because even though they got it all, he knows completely well that cells got away before the surgery. Is that correct? Sure. Now, he didn't know that a whole plant regimen makes cancer grow slow. I am 23 years downstream. I had a PET scan recently because I've got some pain in my leg and we wondered, is it being caused by cancer maybe? They can't. How many of you know anything much about a PET scan and what it does and how powerful it is? Anybody at all? Physician or two here? Uh, very, very sensitive. I, I, I'd love to tell you how a PET scan works, but I won't do that to you. That'd be awful. But it is very, very sensitive. A tumor of three or four cancer cells, it would pick it up. So, are you a radiologist? A physician? What's your, what's your field? He was a patient. Is he a survivor? Yes. <laughs> All right. My urologist knows, friend, friends, that cells got away from that tumor and are making tumors in other places. Are you all with me? But on a plant-based regimen, you can make cancer grow so slow that all of my friends in, the, in medicine, including a couple of urologists, say, Jim, you're never going to die of prostate cancer. Amazing. Oh, well, you say, well, so how did... Did I tell you this story before? Okay. I told it two days ago somewhere. So, oh, so you say, oh, so how, how come you got cancer? Well, you never know, but I think I know why. I was raised on a ranch. We had 5,000 chickens, 12 cattle. We had a T-bone steak cooked over the coals almost every night. It was insanity, friends. We didn't know any better. So that's probably the source of that situation. All right. So what can I do? We have known for 35 years that something called a killer T cell, bottom right, is able to identify the cancer cell and attach to it and bore a hole in it. And then there's a free flow of the intracellular, intercellular fluid and the fluid outside and the cell dies. You have to have a contiguous, that means a continuous with no breaks, cell wall or the cell will die. It has to keep the chemistry correct inside the cell. So this is amazing when this was first discovered. Uh, uh, pretty, pretty good. Now, this is a larger picture. In a moment, I'm going to reduce the screen. I'll show you that. But uh, here's a cell, any cell in our body and it creates some little vesicles, actually with cell wall, strangely enough, and it puts stuff in there. 
So this is the cancer cell. This is the cell that kills uh, cancer cells. And can you see from where you're seated that that looks like a dotted line? It's trying to illustrate that the killer T cell has po poked a bunch of holes in the cancer cell. So let me show a little, little closer. Let's see, let's see that much on the screen. So if, if it's clear to you, the uh, killer T cell has fastened itself here and fastened itself there. And then these vesicles that the killer T cell makes and fills them with something called perforin, these are proteins, and when the vesicle touches the cell wall, are you all with me? This is inside the cell and this is inside the other cell. You all with me on that? And uh, when this vesicle wall, which is cell wall, touches the actual cell wall, it's like that bubble thing. Boop and suddenly it's opened to the outside. And these little particles pour out here, and here's what they do. They go penetrate the cancer cell, and they're designed, I wonder who did that. They're designed so when they stand by each other and hook up, would you stand up a minute, young man, please, quickly. Yes, quickly, stand up here. Right out here in the middle, I won't hurt you, I promise. They're designed so, you stand still now, don't you move. They're designed so when they hook together, they're at an angle. So the next one would be like this, and you'd eventually make what? A circle. Thank you. And that circle, half done there, will soon become a hole. Are you all with me? This is how the killer T cell kills not only cancer cells, but other cells that for some reason have started uh, malf malfunction of some sort and they're, they're, they're destroyed too. It's amazing, folks. We would be dead in 12 hours if it wasn't for all of these amazing things that God does in our bodies. Now, here's the problem. And scientists, they're kind of clever with their names. Why did they call this perforin? Because it what? It perforates the cell. The problem is, friends, these perforins can turn around and clobber the killer T cell. So the killer T cell, I think it's in the next picture. The killer T cell makes another protein called what? You know, science just named it because when that protectin is near a perforin, it can't do its job. Got it? I wish you were more impressed. That is really, that is just so amazing. It's amazing. All right. Okay. Uh, scientists believe, this is hard to prove, but they believe, and it's with pretty good foundation, that every day in every body in this room, 20, 30, 40 cells become cancer cells, and the body just takes care of it. The question is, why do they once in a while miss? That's the question. So, uh, we know of some mechanisms. I'm not going to get to the details, although it's fascinating stuff, but what we're seeing here is several pathways where the killer T cell is inhibited from doing its work. Here it works just fine. It activates the T cell to kill a cancer cell, and there's all kinds of little stuff going on in here chemically. Uh, but one of the interesting ones, you understand I'm trying to show you that there are various ways that inhibit the killer T cell from doing its job. I'm kind of repeating myself, but are you with me in what I'm trying to show you here? One of the ways is an anatomical barrier. Anatomical means you and me, and a barrier occurs principally because of overweight. Listen carefully. The number one risk factor for cancer is overweight because it inhibits circulation. You all with me? And if you have a few extra pounds, 
start eating plants, unrefined, and you'll lose. I promise you, friends, it never fails. You lose those pounds. And you know this. Ellen White says, perfect circulation is what? Perfect health. And the body could kill the cancer cells is the idea. So here are the prevention issues. Normal weight, activity, no smoking, colonoscopy. Let me stop there a minute. I don't know. I, I didn't look this up. I should have. Uh, in America, about 40 years ago, the number one killer of black men was colon cancer. Number two killer of white men. Close to heart attack risk. And what was done about that is, this was before colonoscopies. Uh, gastroenterologists figured out how to look in the colon, and of course you have to empty it. So the, word, the, the nice words they use is a proper, properly prepared colon, which means you drank a gallon of go lightly and you're cleaned out. And uh, they have learned to identify polyps, virtually every cancer, there's some rare exceptions, in the colon starts in what we call a polyp. It's a little added growth to a cell. It's an abnormal growth and will eventually, in many cases, become a tumor. And uh, I have three, four friends, a couple of them really close friends, that are gastroenterologists, and both of them uh, have done colonoscopies on me, and I say, please don't give me any or very much anesthetic. I want to watch on the screen while you do this. Now, I know that sounds crazy to you, but I just want to see. So anyway, um, here's my encouragement. I think you know the rules, but if you don't, if there's anybody in your reasonably close family that had colon cancer, then you should start getting colonoscopies at age 45. If there is none of that, you can wait till 50. If you are living like Americans, and an awful lot of you live like Americans, is that right? I'm talking about what you eat and maybe not getting enough activity. So uh, it's a, it's a, we, we, can, we can prevent something close to 98% of colon cancer folks with colonoscopies. So please uh, be serious about that. I'm going to stop here. There is a little more to this, but I want to jump to the topic that is promised for today, and that is the cancer conundrum. And that's what I'm on. What am I saying? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry. I'm going to carry on with this um, very interesting story. There we go. So. Here are, the, uh, here are the prevention factors, normal weight, activity, no smoking, colonoscopies, whole plant regimen. Now listen to this. I don't know. I should have looked this up too. In America, three quarters of the people have been incorrectly taught that soy is bad. They think it helps cause breast cancer. And somehow that idea got wheels. Do you know what I mean by that expression? And it's insanity. Uh, there is a man in Washington State named Mark Messina, if any of you are taking notes, who is the world authority on soy. He's written about five books, happens to be a friend of mine. <laughs> and uh, when that started circulating, I called him up and I said, Mark, what's, what gives here? He said, Jim, it's just not true. Let me send you a page of research citations showing that that is not true. He sent it to me. And if I had a whiteboard, I'd show you this. So it's going to be a little tougher. But here's what's going on. And it's such misinformation, it makes me sometimes want to scream. Picture a, a uh, organ about like that, an organelle in the body. Uh, and that little organ makes milk in the mother's breast. Uh, and 
if that, if that mother gets breast cancer and the cancer started in that thing, uh, there are estrogen receptors. There's actually two of them on each of these. And if estrogen comes along and hooks up to that receptor, it makes the cancer grow faster. You with me so far? We call it an estrogen positive tumor. And somebody out there somewhere got started the idea that plant phyto, I'm searching for the word, um, I'll think of it in a second. There are substances in plants that are estrogen-like, phytosterols. Plant, it's a chemical formula with certain atoms that make it, we call it a sterol. It's a little bit like uh, a steroid. And they, with no knowledge, it's just almost maddening, somehow got got quoted somewhere that these plant sterols, and some of them are estrogen-like compounds. And we actually sometimes call them plant estrogens. And they somehow got the word out that those estrogens would also make this organ in the breast, uh, if it had cancer, grow faster. You follow what I'm trying to describe? You all with me? It turns out it was false. Uh, that substance from the plant that is estrogen-like does not make the cancer go faster. But it got, got wings, it got wheels, and you talk to almost anybody right now in America, unless they're a professional, and they'll be, they, they believe that soy is bad for you. So, uh, I called my friend, like I say, he sent me those references, I looked through them, quite pleased to see that there was a lot of evidence against this crazy idea. And as time went by, this is in the last five, six years, there were some receptors discovered. Let me just say this, that Mark was telling me that soy helps slow the cancer growth. And all these other people are saying it, 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 it makes it go faster. And uh, so he contacted me and he said, uh, let me send you something else, Jim. And what happened was some researchers found another receptor. I'm going to put it on the bottom here, even though the other two were on the top. Some other receptors that when occupied by soy would make the cancer grow slower. So soy is wonderful food in spite of everything you'll hear in America. Let me ask you, is it kind of general knowledge here that soy is bad because of breast cancer? Some of you are raising your hands. Not true, absolutely. The world authority on soy. It's wonderful that we have these kind of people. Um, now, alcohol. I, I bet 99% of you here don't use alcohol. Maybe some have in the past. But listen to this, this is fairly recent information. Even one drink of alcohol will increase your risk for cancer. Even one. And every drink after that increases the cancer more, the cancer risk. You all with me? I won't have you ra raise your right hand and repeat after me that you're going to quit using alcohol, but... <laughs> Diabetes. Because of the chemistry that's going on in the body, it promotes cancer. In spite, irrespective of, of overweight. Late menarche. When a girl gets her period later than usual, you understand them, I'm sure. Breastfeeding, first child before 30. Why? Um, every menstrual cycle, boy, I need a blackboard. Alan, how far away, is, where's Alan? How, is Alan, oh, there he is. Where, where is that blackboard? Is it here by any chance? Or back at the apartment? Okay, let me just tell you with words. There are these lobules that make milk, about a dozen of them in a cluster. And then there's one duct to take the milk to the infant. And that duct 
has a lining of cells that every menstrual cycle, all those cells die and replace themselves just before they die. So it's a whole new inner tube. Are you all with me on this? Now follow me closely on another point that I haven't made yet. There's no exception to this. All cancer is the result of mutations in the DNA, usually a series of mutations. Mark it down, friends, no exception. Now, the problem is that any cell in your body, I don't care if it's a scratch and it heals and gets better, and you know new cells replace that, right? Any cell anywhere that copies itself, and that happens a lot in our bodies, there are always mutations in the new DNA. You understand the cell that's going to copy itself has to make a copy of the DNA for the new cell. You understand that? Always quite a few mutations in that copy. So here's the point. The lining, every time it replaces itself, increases the risk of breast cancer. You all with me on that? Listen to this. 94% of breast cancer occurs in the milk duct because of that continual re replacement of cells. Got it? Now, I don't think my daughter would mind. Um, I know she wouldn't. She's very upfront. Uh, this is something I haven't told you yet. If you uh, have a child and you're on a, a, a plant-based regimen, and you keep that child on a plant-based regimen, if it's a, if it's a female, it's, 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 it's menarche, or the onset of menstruation, will start years later than normal. The average would be uh, five, six years later menarche, or the onset of menstruation. Which means, oh, and so little Kathy was born. I told you about her this morning. Uh, and as she became a young girl, you know, you talk about it once in a while with your wife. And uh, instead of starting at 11 years of age, which is currently the American average, and I'll bet it's the same here, 11.2. It depends on whose data you look at. Um, she was 16 years old before she started cycling. How many cycles did she miss? Say it's a month instead of 28 days. How many cycles did she miss? Instead of 11, 16. Five years, 12 times five, 60. This girl is way less likely to get breast cancer because she missed all those early cycles. Got it? Well, do we know for sure she started cycling at, at 16 instead of 11 because of her diet? No. Is it likely? Yes. So here comes the second girl about two years later. And she grows up, and guess what? 16 years instead of 11. Both of these girls are at way less risk for breast cancer. Are you all with me on this? Pretty interesting. Any questions? Any comments? You scare me. <laughs> now, Dorothy, I don't know if I can let her get started, because once she started, she will never stop. She was 15 and a half, she says. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Now, by the way, the lobules that make milk also have a lining that re is replaced every cycle. But the rate of cancer in the lobules is higher than the rest of the breast, but still substantially higher than nothing. So, but the big issue is the duct, and then behind that comes the lobule that makes the milk. Chicken. Oh, the chickens are the chickens. The chickens are grown rapidly because they feed them steroids. And well, it happens in the state. Listen, there's a distribution. There are girls that start at eight, etc. 
but we, take, we tend to take the peak of the curve and, and take that as the number. Okay, very good. So you understand why late menarche. Most of you, all you gals know, there is an exception to this. Not every woman who is breastfeeding stops cycling. Once in a while they continue, so that's an issue. First child before, before 30, we have no idea. But the data is there, so if, you're, if your kids or your grandkids, uh, uh, have them get busy if they haven't had a baby yet. Virginity and monogamy. And uh, Neva's sitting here, and I don't want to embarrass her, but we were celibate until we were married, and we have been faithful to each other for 57 years. What's her chance of getting cervical cancer? Zero. Amazing, friends. Amazing. All you young women in this room, I say this not to be cute. Please keep yourself pure. Keep yourself pure. You'll be very thankful as your life goes by. <clears throat> Cervical cancer in the U.S. is becoming a pandemic. It's just sad. Okay. Um, here's the really interesting story. And then we'll try to, if you can stand it, we'll take a break, I suppose, and do one more. I can remember sitting in my office, this is years ago now, reading a scientific journal, and there was a female scientist who reported that she found a gene that caused cancer, and she called it an oncogene. Oncology, onco. And I sat there thinking, <laughs> what? So this began, of course, to be the beginning of a great pursuit. And in the process, I want to get to the place where I have this illustrated, if I can find it quickly. Oh, dear, where is that? There it is. Let's do just a little bit of education on DNA. This magazine was published in 20... I think it was 20... It was in the year 2000. And on the, on the cover, the reason that granddaughter looks a lot like grandma is because they have some similarity in their DNA. Now, you probably know this, but just in case somebody is uninformed, this drawing is a picture of what we call the DNA. It has rungs, if you want to call them that. They're actually made of two half rungs. And in this issue, it, it was a, an amazing uh, bunch of articles about this whole world of DNA. And um, in, if you have a couple of words with the same letters, um, what, what makes the difference in how you pronounce them? Uh -huh. You've got to talk loud. What makes the difference? Who said order? This guy's answering all the questions. The rest of you have got to get busy and answer some of these. <laughs> now, scientists like to use big words to confuse us. Instead of order of the letters. Do you understand those two words have the same letters? It's the order of the letters that makes the difference. Only a scientist would say it's the sequence of the letters. And so, you're mostly familiar with this, I know. So we sequence the order of the rungs. It cost over a billion dollars. And this is just a drawing I made without the twist. And I'm just showing here that there's four kinds of half rungs, A's, T's, C's, and G's. And A's only hook with T's. Notice T's only hook with A's. And G's only hook with C's. That was a very amazing discovery made in 1953 and shortly thereafter. And in the DNA, there are 
Now the number escapes me. Billions of these rungs and uh, a piece of the DNA is a gene. And didn't, I, didn't we talk briefly already of what the function of a gene is? Didn't we do that? Did we? <laughs> okay, I'll tell you. What does a gene do? It has the information for the cell to make a certain protein. Remember that now? Okay. And the information is the order of the letters. That's where the information is, just like the order of the letters help you to know how to pronounce this thing. So, um, this lady found a gene. This is just illustrative, folks. It could have been way longer, but it's just illustrative that she thought caused cancer. And, uh, but, well, it didn't cause cancer, so they said, well, it's inactivated. And it was very likely the possibility. Um, so they called it a proto-oncogene. proto, -oncogene. proto -sin oh, scientists love to use that word. It means before. Uh, they think that Pluto was a proto-planet. What does that mean? Uh, it's, it's not big enough yet to be a planet, so they use this fancy word, a proto-planet. Um, and uh, as they studied this, it became a little bit confusing because it seemed like something else was going on. And, uh, oh, okay, uh, it needed a mutation uh, before it could make cancer, perhaps. And then they got to studying more, and they found out there was another gene that was involved with this, and this is one of the most amazing things. There's so many amazing things about our bodies that uh, was much bigger than I'm showing you. These are just illustrative. And they found out that that was a tumor suppressor gene, which is what was confusing them about this one, because sometimes it seemed to and sometimes seemed not to make cancer. Now, a tumor suppressor gene has the information to make a protein that would fix the mistakes in the DNA. Got it? This was learned over a pretty good stretch of time. And I'm going to show you a picture of it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so this was all involved with research on breast cancer. And, and at first they thought maybe this thing was causing cancer in some strange way. Uh, but in any case, they named it BR for breast and CA for cancer. Before long they found another one, so they made it BRCA1 and BRCA2. How many of you, I was going to ask the women, but it doesn't matter who, how many of you have ever heard of the BRCA1 or the BRCA2 genes? Can I see your hands? Not too many. You've all heard of them now, right? What do they do? It turns out that that gene codes for a protein, I'm repeating myself, that fixes the mistakes in the DNA. Got it? Should we have a quiz at the end? These, these concepts sound simple to me. It makes a protein that fixes mistakes. Isn't that easy? We call it a tumor suppressor gene. And uh, scientists have decoded what the, what the protein looks like. It uh, takes 181,000 rungs, amazing, in the DNA ladder for the information to make this protein. And I think the next slide has a picture of it. I wish you all would have said, ooh. Look at this. I wish I could make it 3D. You got little lines of amino acids. Do you understand that proteins are made up of a string of amino acids? And then your cell folds them up into a certain shape to do a certain job. And so here you have very interesting shaping of the straight line of amino acids. But then you make the amino acids in such proliferation they go side by side and they make a coil. This is very common in complex proteins. Four coils, all these lines, and this thing is not a living organ. 
it's a, it's a molecule that actually can move along the DNA and figure out there were mistakes and fix them. Is that worth saying ooh about? I wish you were much more excited than that. When this was discovered, people, the scientists just sat there and shook their heads. This is way, way too complex to have happened by chance. If you get one amino acid, the wrong one in that long chain, it won't work as well or won't work at all. Isn't that amazing? Our creator. This, this just, I look at this, folks, and it's just, I'm astonished and thankful and amazed at all of that. It takes a lot of rungs. It has, listen to this, 1,800 amino acids to make this shape that repairs the DNA. Now, I don't know where you are in comparison to American women, but most American women are aware of the fact that they might have the cancer gene or not. That make a little sense? Have you heard that kind of thing? Okay. It's a misappropriation of the idea. Every woman, every man, um, has a copy of that gene from both mom and dad. So what the woman means, and I have no, I'm not criticizing her, what she means is if she has the cancer gene, she means that she has some mutations in the cancer gene that make that shape wrong so she can't be protected from cancer as much. Got that? Do I need to say it again? If the gene has the information to make this beautiful thing, is it still on the screen? Uh, and if the gene had a mistake here or there, then that shape would be slightly different, correct? And it couldn't do its job of fixing the new DNA. Amazing, just astonishing. Uh, our God and his beautiful creative hand then they found another one. So they had to say BRCA1 and BRCA2, uh, and uh, on it went. And there is the tumor suppressor gene, just illustrated from here to here. Actually, how many rungs did it take? 18, 1,800 amino acids times three is how many rungs it would take. So it's an amazing story. So the real question then is, what causes mutations? All cancer is the result of mutations. Every time a cell copies itself, there are mutations. So one of them, I don't know if I put it first, I should have, is copy error. You all with me on that? Cell copies itself. Did, did any of you grow up when you were kids and you kept scratching someplace and it would bleed and then it would heal and you'd scratch it some more and your mother said, don't do that. You remember that? Why? You could cause cancer. Why? You're making cells replicate and replicate and replicate and replicate, and every time they replicate, there are mistakes, right? That's the kind of thing. And by the way, repeated injury anywhere in the body can do that, can increase the chance for cancer for these reasons I've been talking about. Radiation, you all know this. Uh, it bothers me when I go see my physician friend. He says, I want to x-ray your knee because I broke my leg here about seven months ago. I don't want another 10 x-rays. Just do one to see if that thing healed, right? Don't let them do that to you. Um, toxins is a fancy word for poisons. Uh, where, where, by the way, where else does radiation come from besides x-rays? Were you saying something, dear? Go ahead and say it. I can't hear what she said. Ah. Co correct, but not correct. Since you brought it up, I'm going to tell you. I need a blackboard, but I'm going to do it in the air. Is, isn't mo aren't most people thinking about things like microwaves? And whether or not they're good or bad? And do people have strong opinions on both sides? Yeah. Now, you can believe me, though, because I'm right. <laughs> Listen, radiation is my world as a physicist. Do you understand that? So I'm going to draw you a picture up here in the air 
of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. Radio waves, microwaves, light waves are all electromagnetic radiation. I won't bother you with exactly what that means, but it has a wavelength. And so at this end of the spectrum, we have radio waves that are thousands of miles long. As you move from your left to your right, the wavelength shortens up to uh, radio wave, radio waves for radio. AM, FM, radar, aircraft radio transmissions, all the same stuff. Only difference, wavelength. Y'all with me? By the time you get to FM, the waves are about that long. And as the wavelength gets shorter, there is more energy in the wave. Got that? And uh, along right about in here, you come to microwaves, about that long. A little longer than some of the others, but about that long. And uh, you keep coming, and pretty soon you get to infrared, where the wavelength is about that long. And then you get to visible light, where the wavelength is almost closer than you can put your fingers. Thickness of paper. And that's uh, from red to violet. The violet is even shorter, and the ultraviolet is even shorter. Are you all with me? The microwaves inside the oven are strong enough to heat something. You all know that. But the door on the oven, did you notice that it's made of a piece of metal with a bunch of little holes in it? The function of those holes is, if the radiation tries to leak out, it kind of cancels each other on the other side. So microwave radiation harming people, you cannot find a physicist in the world, a competently trained physicist, that would agree with that. Just absolutely not the case. Now, inside the microwave, and let me back up one step and say, in the world of physics, there is something we call intensity. You can build a device that can make any frequency much more intense, not different wavelength, just stronger. And you could make it strong enough at any wavelength to cause heat damage to an organism or to a person. You all with me on this? So, what, what, most of the people that talk about this know nothing of all of this. Am I right? They've just heard somebody that sounds, you know what my wife says about me? She says, believe, people believe you because you sound like you know what you're talking about. Now, she doesn't like me to say it that way. She actually believes I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> But I like the, uh, that's a really cute phrase, isn't it? You sound like you know what you're talking about. Isn't that, doesn't that happen out there? People that, people can make you think they know what they're talking about because just the way they talk. Is that right? Sure. And so you need to consult with somebody that really knows. And the, the issue, folks, is a microwave is a totally non-issue. Now, you shouldn't override the interlock and stick your hand in there and turn it on, right? That wouldn't be very smart because inside the microwave, the intensity is high enough to heat something. And so, but the idea that microwaves are bad. Listen, I don't care if you never use a microwave in your life. Don't misunderstand me. I would like you to be informed. Do you understand that? Sure. <clears throat> okay. How did I get sidetracked on that? <laughs> radiation. Okay. Where else does radiation come from? Cell phone? He's correct. He's correct, but it's not intense enough, friends, to do any damage. You all with me? It's crazy what happens on the Internet. I saw one time these four kids are sitting around a table, and they each put their cell phone like that, and they turned them on, whatever turn on means, um, and then they took an egg and cracked it on the table, in, in all, and the egg fried. And the average person, I mean, wow, that's, that's really something. And uh, it didn't take me two seconds to realize that that was total baloney. They had a 
Benson burner under the table that made the egg fried. But the average person might believe that. Am I correct? It's crazy. It's like uh, when we were working at Weimar. I had seen this before, but Neva came to me with an email where somebody showed that when they poured microwave water, microwaved water on the plants, it killed them. I knew way better than that, friends. But I said to her, and she knew it too, I said, why don't you test it? So she got a bunch of seeds, and she started growing these flowers. And I said, now listen, sweetheart, you got to think about this. If you're going to heat the water in the microwave, then you got to heat the water that you're pouring on it from the sink. Fair enough. And uh, one thing that ought to be obvious instantly, you can't pour boiling hot water on a plant, it'll kill it. So you have to let the water cool. But some, there are some people, I say this kindly, crazy enough to believe that the water has somehow been affected by that, even if you cool it. And if you, you believe that, I love you, but quit believing it's crazy. Anyway, she did the experiment, 